Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and good evening to everyone. Welcome to the first Smart Partnership Initiative 2.0 webinar series. We are delighted to have everyone here to join us on today's interesting webinar. My name is Hafiz Jofri and I will be acting as your moderator for today's forum. Um, it has been an ongoing discussion all over the world about how we are adapting to the new norms in everyday situation, regardless of work, lifestyles, or even holidays. However, let's not forget on the core issue as has been narrated by Sir David Attenborough that climate change is the biggest threat to security that modern human has ever faced. As far as the science facts are concerned, climate change is indeed real and it happens everywhere, including Malaysia, as we are all living in the same blue planet where the natural system, physical world, biotic and abiotic processes are all connected in the great circle of life. The topic of our discussion for today's session is El Nino, La Nina, Impacts and Polar Tropical Inter Teleconnection. And joining us today, we have here with us three panelists that will be discussing and share their views on the reality that we are facing today. Before we begin, allow me to briefly introduce our esteemed panelists for today. Our first panelist, we have Dr. Shiba Chenoli. She is a climate scientist attached to the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, University of Malaya. She chairs an acting group on tropical and Antarctic teleconnection TATE under the scientific community on Antarctic Research SCAR, and also an active member of the International Commission on Polar Meteorology. Welcome, Doctor, and thank you very much for joining us. We are delighted to have you here. Um, next, our very own lecturer from Marine Geoscience Program at the Faculty of Science and Marine Environment, University of Malaysia Terengganu, Dr. Afi Helmi Arfin. He is a geomorphologist where his research mainly centered on understanding coastal morphodynamic from external factors and its impact within diverse coastal management strategies. Thank you very much, Dr. Afi, for joining us today. 
Um, and finally, introducing our third panelist, Dr. Ruhiza Rusli. He is a senior lecturer from the School of Housing, Building and Planning, University of Science, Malaysia. His research work is mainly focusing on settlement in ASEAN countries in normal and emergency situation. He was elected a Mohe Postdoctoral Fellow at the School of Arts and Social Science, Monash University and Fellowship for Climate Action at Indian Anand National University. Once again, thank you very much for joining us today. It is a privilege for me yeah, to welcome our you. panelists and we appreciate our effort for taking the time to be part of our today's forum session. Before we kick start the program, here is a quick note to everyone. We have in total two rounds for this forum. The first round, each of the panelists will be given a 15 to 20 minutes duration to, leave it, to deliver their presentations. And then we will proceed with the second round, which is the question and answer session, where I will open the floor to the participant if you have any question to the speakers. Please be reminded to kindly mute your microphone as this session is underway. And if you have any question, please write it down in the chat box section located on the right hand side of your screen. And your question will be edited in the second round. So without further ado, I would like to invite our first speaker, Dr. Shiba, to deliver her presentation, please. Good afternoon, everyone. You can, I hope you can hear me and see my slide, right? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, um, thank you very much. And uh, as um, the moderator, I mean, you have heard from the moderator, my name is uh, Shiba Chenoli and I'm from the Department of Geography in the University of Malaya. And I'm also a research associate at the National Antarctic Research Center. Okay, so here is the outline of my talk. Today, I would like to focus on two climate phenomena. The first one is the natural tropical variability called El Nino and La Nina. Together, we call it as um, El Nino Southern Oscillation. So second part of my talk, I would like to focus on teleconnection between the polar and tropical uh, weather and climate. So I'll be focusing more on this part and I'll be discussing um, about the relationship between the Arctic variable and our Northeast monsoon and how the Antarctic sea ice variability impacts on the um, Indian summer monsoon. So the periodic changes in the sea surface temperature over Pacific Ocean uh, that have impacts on weather all over the globe uh, is called El Nino Southern Oscillation. So this uh, oscillation is actually a large scale natural climate variability that exerts impacts around the globe through the atmospheric circulation um, as well as the um, regional IC interaction. So ENSO has a uh, two phase, uh, which is uh, El Nino and La Nina. El Nino, as we all know, is the warmer phase and La Nina is, a, is the colder phase. So now let us look at the neutral situation first. So in the neutral situation, uh, that is, it, it, it is not El Nino or not El Nino, La Nina, the trade winds blows uh, from east to west across the surface of the uh, tropical Pacific Ocean. And this will bring warm, moist air um, and warmer water towards the Western Pacific, um, keeping the Central and Eastern Pacific uh, relatively cool. So warm surface um, temperature in the Western Pacific will pump the heat and moisture into the atmosphere above and the warm um, air rises developing um, you know, towering cumulonimbus clouds and rain over the maritime continent. So this is the uh, neutral condition. So let us look at what happens during um, El Nino and La Nina. 
So these figures here uh, show El Nino and La Nina situation. Um, during El Nino event, the trade winds become weakened, uh, allowing, allowing the area of warmer water to move into the central and eastern uh, tropical Pacific Ocean. So sea surface temperature around our region are cooler than the normal, and the uh, focus of convection uh, now migrate uh, towards the um, eastward um, side of the uh, eastward and the central side of the eastern pacific um, and this results increased rainfall over the um, south american coast um, near peru and also uh, near the kiribati islands and we have less rainfall over the maritime continent and there is a uh, greatest impacts um, also felt over the inland of um, eastern uh, australia um, so uh, what happens during La Nina? During La Nina, the trade winds become stronger and strong winds blow warmer water at the ocean surface from South America to the maritime continent. Um, as the warmer water moves towards the west, colder water from the subsurface around the eastern um, Pacific, along the uh, coast of Peru and uh, South America, and this means the places over the uh, Western Pacific, um, like uh, Indonesia and uh, the maritime continent, can get much more um, rain, um, I mean, higher than the usual. So, however, the cold water in the Eastern Pacific causes less rain clouds um, there. So, um, to summarize, and so usually swings between three phases, Lanina, um, neutral phase and alino phase. We usually consider the neutral uh, phase as the normal phase because we are in the stage more than half of the time. So typical alino phase usually starts um, in the first part of the year and lasts till uh, the following year and ends in autumn. Sometimes we can get the same phase for two or more years in a row. And um, on the average, it takes about um, four years to sing from La Nina to El Nino and then back again. So um, typically uh, the ONI index or Oceanic Nino index is used um, to monitor and so, um, and which is based on the sea, sea surface average sea surface temperature anomaly uh, between five degree um, south and north between the uh, longitude of 170 degree west and 120 degree west. So when this sea surface temperature anomaly over the central and eastern Pacific uh, near the equator exceeds um, plus or minus 0 0.5 degree for three consecutive months, we call it as uh, El Nino or a La Nina phase. So um, how we uh, calculate the intensity or how we know the intensity of El Nino, it's based on the sea surface temperature anomaly. Um, for weak um, El Nino, uh, the sea surface temperature anomaly will be between 0 0.5 to 0 0.9 degrees centigrade. Or for moderate, it's 1 to 1.4 degree. And if it is more than 1.5 degrees centigrade, we will say it is a strong um, El Nino here. So um, now uh, we can look at the impact on our weather and climate. Generally, um, El Nino phase, uh, we all know that um, it contributes dry condition and La Nina tends to enhance the precipitation extremes. So impacts of El Nino uh, on precipitation um, were um, actually shown to be um, dependent on the intensity, season, and also location. That means the El Nino and La Nina influences on the precipitation extremes are not entirely uh, linear. So um, this figures here shows the impact of uh, precipitation over different region over Malaysia and different phases of um, El Nino. Um, so um, how does the different phases of El Nino impact over our region? As we all know that um, Malaysia and Southeast Asia region generally experience drought condition during El Nino where often associated with um, severe uh, haze episode also. So during uh, June, July, August, Peninsula Malaysia uh, Sumatra and the southern Borneo um, usually experience um, drought condition, um, as you can see here, the first figure. And um, sometimes it will also accompanied by severe uh, haze episodes. And during um, September, October, November, southern part of Sumatra, Java, and Borneo experience drier than the normal condition. 
and during this period condition of a peninsula um, sometimes returns to the normal however the episodes of um, haze uh, could also develop due to the dry condition over sumatra So generally, um, La Nina um, is related to the anomalies over the region, um, can be um, viewed as opposite to El Nino. Um, that means the better than the normal condition. So this is due to the strengthening of trade winds over the Pacific Ocean during a La Nina uh, period. And there will be anomalous convergence of moisture uh, over Southeast Asian region. And sometimes um, it will be also associated with the occurrence of uh, flood during this period. And La Nina can have entirely different impacts uh, depending on different categories. That means when um, during a strong La Nina uh, and during uh, December, January, February, it can cause significant decrease, actually the decrease in the uh, precipitation and moderate um, El Nino, uh, moderate La Nina can increase the wet precipitation over the uh, peninsula Malaysia. So, um, Henso, Henso uh, phenomenon uh, does not no, uh, only uh, affect the rainfall distribution, it can also influ influence the onset of monsoon date during southwest monsoon as well as northeast monsoon. So most of the El Nino years, um, it was shown that um, there is a delay in the um, southwest monsoon um, uh, onset date. As you can see, most of the onset date is delayed. and. Um, um, and the, um, there is a correlation um, between um, the onset date as well as the uh, Oceo, Ocean uh, Nino Index um, that is shown in the second figure here. During Northeast monsoon also, onset dates are influenced by ENSO, uh, but the influence is a bit different uh, compared to the Southwest monsoon. In general, uh, arrival of non Northeast earlies in the Northern uh, South China Sea region trend to be um, early during um, El Nino and late during La Nina years. However, it is not always the case for the onset of Northeast monsoon. So if the El Nino developed during winter, then the onset date can be late. And if the El Nino are developed over summer, there will be early onset. So La Nina events can enhance the middle latitude northeasterlies, north as I mentioned earlier, uh, in South China Sea. And it set an early onset of northeast monsoon in the Western maritime continent. So late onset can be expected when um, La Nina develops in uh, September. And so also causes environmental and uh, social uh, economical impacts. Um, so um, the enhanced air temperature affects, it can affect the terrestrial ecosystem, public health, air quality due to the production of photochemical smog. Uh, worsening of air quality is also caused, caused by the transboundary haze due to the biomass burning in Indonesia during if the um, drought period is prolonged. And transboundary um, haze reduces the visibility, it can disrupt the air flight, and we are very familiar with the school uh, closure and controlled outdoor activities due to poor air quality as well as the haze situation during El Nino years. And the health of um, high risk groups such as uh, children, senior citizens, and who are suffering from um, asthma, bronchitis, etc., allergies, uh, etc., also will be affected. And according to the newspaper, uh, GDP, there was a G decrease in the GDP of 4.7 percentage during the worst El Nino um, that was occurred between uh, 1996 and 1998 um, due to the regional financial crisis um, that is caused by the impact of El Nino, uh, which has affected agriculture as well as the industrial productivity. And this enhanced um, sea surface temperature during El Nino event also can affect the marine ecosystem, including fisheries and uh, coral bleaching. And always the um, anomalous wet conditions are occur in conjunction with La Nina, which can cause flood and to buy the um, social um, economic impacts. 
So now we can look at the current situation. Um, according to the National Oceani Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, which is under the US Department of Commerce, the recent value of uh, the heat anomalies shows negative uh, sea surface temperature, as you can see from the figure, and um, uh, ne negative sea surface temperature anomalies, which extended across the equator of the Pacific Ocean. Also, tropical atmospheric circulation is inconsistent with the um, Lanina phase. And most of the models from the Climate Prediction Center predicts transition to um, from transition of an ENSO neutral during the Northern Hemispheric um, Spring in 2021. So in summary, transition from La Nina to ENSO neutral is likely to happen in the next month or so, with an 80% um, of um, a chance of um, ENSO neutral during May and July 2021. So that's all about the um, El Nino Southern Oscillation. Um, now we can look into the teleconnection. Uh, the term uh, teleconnection in the atmospheric science usually refers to the linkages between the climate, um, with this which is geographically separated region, where the variation of the remote regional climate is caused by the changes in the um, some other um, climate in another place. So any statistically significant long-range uh, linkages between high and uh, low latitudes are usually referred to as teleconnection. Condition. So um, this two region need not exhibit the similar kind of fluctuations. I mean, um, it, it may not be the same sign to be uh, teleconnected. In fact, the more interesting teleconnection involve um, you know opposite variations and opposite variation in the uh, climate parameters. So understanding uh, the mechanism of teleconnection could provide more interest into the mechanism of the interaction between the polar region and the tropical region. For example, um, if you are looking at the um, relationship between sea ice condition over Antarctic or Arctic and its influence on the Asian, mons Asian monsoons. So if you, if you understand this mechanism, we will know how um, these two uh, regions are interacting with each other. And um, it was shown that teleconnection studies may also able to enhance the predictability of monsoon system and the strength. So it is very important to understand this mechanism, especially um, under the climate change scenarios. So if you understand this mechanism, then only we will know how this uh, relationship is going to change under, under the um, warming world. So if you look at the literature, the the past um, earlier work of um, tropical teleconnection were primarily focused on ENSO related teleconnection. Classic example is um, Professor David Brownwich's papers and also uh, Caroli's uh, papers. So um, later on, a series of studies is followed uh, focusing on the teleconnection from Atlantic. And in the recent years, you can see more attention has been paid to the teleconnection between polar region, middle latitude, and also uh, tropical climate variability including monsoon rainfall. So in this talk, I'll be focusing on um, our group's work on relationship between the polar um, climate variability with the uh, uh, monsoon variability. So let me introduce another natural variability, which is called Arctic Oscillation. Uh, this is just like the ENSO, um, El Nino Southern Oscillation. So there are positive and negative phases of Arctic Oscillation. For positive phase, uh, it is characterized by the lower than average air pressure over Arctic, and it is paired with higher than average pressure over the Northern Pacific uh, Atlantic Ocean middle latitude. So during this period, what happens is that the jet stream become um, more um, jet stream will shift to further north and average um, um, further north than the average uh, condition and the storms can be also shifted northwards of their usual path. So um, because of that middle latitude uh, uh, countries such as um, North America, Europe, Siberia, they will generally receive fewer uh, cold outbreaks than usual. And uh, the other phase is the negative uh, phase um, has the higher than average pressure over Arctic region and lower than average pressure over the Northern Pacific. So during this time, jet stream will move um, 
towards the uh, equator and this condition, the locations in the middle latitude will experience more outbreak of uh, frigid cold air and uh, winters will be uh, more severe. But that is what just happened in the US. There were many um, snowstorms during this time because of um, the negative phase of AO. So when I explain uh, the Antarctic Oscillation, you might be thinking how I'm going to connect it to you know, our region, right? So let us um, look into another climate feature which is closely related to us, that is Northeast Monsoon, and where we receive uh, most of the rainfall along the East Coast and sometimes flooding too. So one of the key components of winter monsoon is Siberian High, which is the high pressure region over Siberia. So Northeast Monsoon usually starts with this strengthening of Siberian high and the outbreak of cold northwesterly wind, which is known as uh, cold surges, which turn into northeasterlies and uh, when it reaches over our region. And this is because of the pressure gradient that is developed be between the Siberian high and my maritime continent. So um, this will bring a heavy rainfall and the strength of cold surges depend on many factors such as the strength, and strength as well as the position of Siberian high, etc. Now we can look at how does um, AO, Arctic Oscillation, influence our weather. Right uh, now, I present here is the mean sea level pressure anomaly and temperature anomaly during um, uh, AO positive. That means the positive phase of Arctic Oscillation. So anomaly means just how much is the temperature or pressure changes from the average. So here you can see um, there is um, during um, the positive phase of um, um, Arctic Oscillation, the um, mean sea level is lower than the um, normal and uh, the temperature, uh, the temperature anomaly is um, higher than the normal. So this means a Siberian high will be weaker during positive um, phase of Arctic Oscillation. And these uh, opposite um, features occur during the um, the negative phase of Arctic Oscillation. The Siberian high will be stronger and the temperature is lower. Temperature is lower means Siberian high will be automatically stronger. So that means we will have uh, more um, cold surges and more intense um, Northeast monsoon during that uh, phase. So an index called Siberian High uh, Mari um, Maritime Continent Index um, was developed to represent the mean sea level pressure difference between the Siberian High as well as the warm pool over the maritime continent. So this, indi this index indicate the strong linkage between the monsoon circulation and a positive um, strong value of um, this index is associated with strong meridional wind and intense frequent cold surges over the uh, South China Sea. So correlation between AO index and uh, the um, SHMCI shows that uh, there is a statistically significant relationship between them. So that means there is an influence of Arctic Oscillation over Northeast Monsoon of, of our region. So at present, a PhD student is working on this project to look further at the mechanism of this two um, relationship. So this one is extremely important, especially under the climate change scenario, to understand how the impact of Arctic warming um, will impact on the Northeast monsoon. So now we can move on to the uh, Antarctic teleconnection. Um, so um, here we look into the Antarctic sea ice extent, which is an extremely important feature of Southern polar region. It is also known as an essential factor in the um, climate system. And um, we first tried um, to look at um, if there exists any statistical linkage between the Antarctic sea ice extent and monsoon rainfall. So the result shows that there is a positive um, correlation between the um, the Antarctic sea ice extent um, over the Indian Ocean sector uh, during uh, April, May, June, which is correlated with the Indian summer monsoon rainfall over the peninsula region. 
So in order to identify the mechanism uh, between the sea ice extent and the Indian monsoon um, rainfall, we also look into the spatial correlation uh, with the sea ice extent and mean sea level pressure, um, as well as the rainfall. And the figure clearly indicates that uh, there is a positive correlation between the uh, sea ice extent with the mean sea level pressure anomaly over the southern Indian Ocean between 30 um, degree south and 50 degrees south. In contrast, there is a negative correlation over the Antarctic region and also Southern Ocean. Then we also divide this um, ice uh, phase uh, based on the positive and negative ice phase here. This is to produce um, some uh, composite analysis to know how uh, the um, the uh, mean sea level pressure changes during high sea ice phase and low sea ice phase. So the figure clearly shows that um, during uh, the positive anomaly, uh, the uh, anticyclone over uh, this region between 40 to 60 degree um, strengthen. That means the um, mascarine high over this region is stronger um, uh, uh, due to during the high sea ice phase. And you can also see a lot of um, outflow coming from the Antarctic. That means the, uh, the sea ice is extending. And here you can see the inter um, hemispherical flow, which is enhanced um, during the high sea ice phase. So uh, to examine the impact of a uh, mascarine high, we again produce another index, which is called temporal mascarine high region. Um, and uh, um, the composite analysis is also uh, carried out during the positive and negative phases. And you can see during the positive phase, um, there is um, stronger convergence over Arabian Sea and uh, uh, Peninsula India, which indicate the strong ascending motion over that region, um, which will uh, enhance the development of cloud and heavy we rain over this region. So um, to conclude, uh, during the high sea ice phase, mascarine high is intensified, as you can uh, see from the uh, schematic diagram here. Um, so uh, this intensification of mascarine high will give uh, more, um, the strengthened mascarine high will give a uh, more stronger Somali jet, and it will carry stronger convergence over the uh, coastal and west peninsula India, uh, having a, a higher uh, than the normal uh, Indian monsoon rainfall. And during the low uh, sea ice phase, there will be a, a stronger um, cyclonic anomaly. And because of that, there will be a stronger divergence over India and that cause less um, Indian summer monsoon rainfall. So this is uh, my summary. Um, we can see there is an impact of ENSO um, and affects, it affects the rainfall distribution over Malaysia through the influence of, um, but the influence is non-linear. And ENSO also influenced the onset of monsoon date, both during the Southwest monsoon, as well as the Northeast monsoon. And also polar teleconnection uh, play an important role in modulating our weather, equatorial weather and climate. And uh, we can see there is a strong relationship between the Arctic Oscillation and winter monsoon over uh, Malaysia. And the correlation analysis um, shows that um, AHO has been a strong effect on the Siberian high, thus this influencing the winter monsoon rainfall. And variability of sea ice extent over Indian Ocean sector of Antarctic show a significant relationship between the Indian um, summer monsoon rainfall. And um, well, uh, this brings me to the end of my talk. I would like to thank our moderator as well as the YPSM for inviting me to give this talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Shiva, for the insightful presentation that has been delivered just now. Um, next, I would like to call upon Dr. Afi Helmi Arifin to deliver your presentation. So without further ado, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Afis. Uh, and uh, group presentation from Dr. Shiba. And then uh, for my presentation, I'm not uh, truly go further in more theory about the ENSO or LINA or LINO because uh, my, my study about impact after the LINO or LINA. So a little bit about uh, our studies from my postgraduate students. Uh, 
uh, about the impact of the 19 tropical storms uh, that we call Pabo on the beach morphology Tenganu coast in Malaysia. Uh, and next, next please. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this is our online where we will start about introductions and then and on to a summary. So about a little bit about introduction that uh, as we know the northeast monsoon is come from uh, the uh, is uh, from the China to the Philippines and then uh, from the southwest more to south uh, from the India. So and then after the tropical storm, uh, it become to more uh, significant on the stabilized on uh, the condition of the monsoon, especially on rainfall and also the pressure or the uh, air pressure or the, also the ocean pressures. So when the when the, the pressure is become uh, have a, some significance of the uh, differentiate uh, by the year, so the monsoon can become uh, to become more late or become to more uh, more faster because uh, sometimes the depend on the depend on the situation also. Okay, so next uh, slide, please. Okay, uh, and then about the Elina or Elina. So Dr. Shiba already uh, presented about uh, the 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 Elino, how they remove one or how the Elino we move to the South Asia, but mostly in our our region or especially in Tengganu, the La Nina effect on uh, actually on the monsoon, monsoons, because uh, more heavy have a heavy on uh, by the rainfall and then more increase the storms. So mostly when the storm is become uh, during La Nina, the storm surge will be more increase uh, compared to the previous year by. Uh, only by the significant by the tropical storms, but when the the storm surge is become to parallel to the coastline, so it can become more to flood or erosion, uh, and then uh, in opposite or by the, the during the Elino season by the west coast, we become have a droughts or uh, and then uh, more drought to dries and then also impact on agriculture. Okay, so next next. Next slide, please. Okay, so next. Next, okay. So about the 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 bubbles that when we uh, occur during two thousand nineteen by January. So be before the the uh, the bubble is started, uh, for the Sultan Sea, go to uh, Tenggara and Thailand. Uh, sorry, Tenggara, Kelantan, and then end on an Andaman Sea. Uh, we can see. The pattern on previous year by the monsoon, especially on the rainfall, is more to dry. So normally the the season by more wet or more heavy rainfall during the December. But this time on 2018, end of December, or on 2018, uh, the rainfall is not uh, heavy compared to the previous year. And then after that, the the ocean become more warm, and then it's more create a more pressure, and then. Uh, to uh, stabilize the, the ocean uh, pressure or ocean warmth, uh, the tropical storm is become uh, to the parallel to the South China Sea. Okay, so it's a, just an example when the effect from the storm at the Thailands, when the surge is coming around two meters uh, to the coastline compared to uh, compared to the normal monsoon wave, uh, mostly uh, the parallel to the coastline around 0 0.5 to 1.5 meters. But this time, uh, the 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 sea height or the wave height can become more two uh, and above. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, and then also uh, many discussion from the bubbles uh, in Thailand, and also uh, during this season, Tengganu uh, also have a problem for the coastal erosions. So uh, then and then most of the erosion. Uh, need to have uh, we call to need to to the authorities need to to find what the causes what the the influence by the erosions. So mostly by by the natural factor, especially on a storm surge, and then uh, the requirement that uh, existing 
existing embankment along the coastline or parallel to the coastline not enough uh, on the beach dunes around uh, up to means level around 2.2 something like that so the, the authorities need to to count also to simulate how the existing uh, the development can 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 sustain on the coastline okay next please okay and then uh, on 2020 that's uh, the ombak we call the wave uh, to more to more highest compared to to previous year because uh, this is the impact from the uh, storm surge or the impact of the bubble. Okay, so mostly, um, yeah, we need to understand why the Alino or Lanina uh, to to have what we call to uh, how the Lanina or Lanino can influence on the, 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 the solutions. But mostly, we cannot see the directly impact on the Lanina and Lanino, uh, but normally on the floods. But when the flight is coming by the rainfall, by, by the heavy rainfall, so it's automatic by uh, the storm surge also become because the water level increase and then uh, then influenced by the monsoon storms and then uh, the erosion more highest compared to the previous year. So this example on steel and colon rolls, but we have a six station from the Barik Chil until Teluk Tapang, they have a six station. Uh, the, the different shade of the erosion also different compared to the by the steel and coral rose. Why? Because the steel are protected by the Asia island that you can see from here. Uh, the the Redang island uh, are protected uh, then Kuantian and Midong also protected the steel compared to the coral rose have a direct impact for the monsoon storms. So, and then uh, when the Lina or the, the, the storms is, uh, uh, go into the coastline, uh, it can be what I call uh, compare the previous uh, erosion around 0 0.5 to 0 0.8, just the elevation uh, are different shades. But during the during the Lanina and then actually on the, uh, the, the storms uh, by the bubbles, also it can be more to 1.2 or 1.5 uh, the difference for the erosion for by the elevation. Okay, so next slide, please. Okay, so the objective in uh, our students uh, to measure, and then this is just just sharing a session what we we investigate, what we study along the coastline. So the first one to measure the change of changes of beach morphology patterns at Lanao Coast, and the second one to identify the beach dynamic on active coastal setting during monsoonal and tropical storm season. So uh, and then mostly the Lanina and Lino are impacted by. Uh, again, like the uh, Chiba uh, told to everybody that uh, the the Lina and Lino is very impact to the monsoon uh, seasons, but not uh, impact directly to the ecosystem or the impact of uh, communities. But after that, when when the, the Lina become to to my more impacted to the coastline, so we can see yeah after the after the Lina we can see. Yeah, a little bit erosion is different compared to the previous year. But the direct impact we can see, uh, like uh, because the the changes of the changes of the water level or the changes of Wi-Fi is very very uh, uh, just a few, just around 0 0.2, 0 0.4. But when when the surge is coming, uh, with also the water level are uh, increased, and then we can see the erosion more. More work or more more impacted to the coastline. Okay, so next slide, slide please. Okay, so next, just this is just methodology. Okay, next, please. Okay. So uh, and then we can see from here the 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 at the steel, um, but uh, when the 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 island is protected along the coastline, we can see from the figure the 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 beaches or the beach uh, more more descriptive or more not the high gradient on the slopes, and then but uh, also the the significant on the erosion still can 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 be uh, can can be seen from the changes, but. 
uh, mostly uh, in this area are protected because of, of the islands. Okay, so next. Okay, compared to compared to uh, at the, the the first one is S four is Pekamaras. We can see the erosion uh, not totally full recovery because uh, it's totally in, uh, uh, corrupted or totally uh, eroded uh, along coastline because the impacted of the, the 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 storms is directly and then uh, also include also the anthropogenic activities. So sometimes. Uh, the beach is need to take more more time to to full recovery or to more have a tendency to recover him. Okay, but uh, in Kelopak Tapang, we can see don't have a much difference because uh, this area are protected by the structures or and then uh, also the beach nourishment uh, occur in this area. So we can see uh, many factor of erosions, but not totally directly for one uh, factor or one influence because what we can see uh, sometimes is can be impacted from the nature by the monsoons, monsoon stops but sometimes uh, including by the monsoon storm and also by the by the green activities and then parallel to the coastlines uh, and then the coastal are impacted by by uh, by erosion and by also the sediment supply uh, that they have uh, some less of sediment supply on the, the sediment distribution. Okay, so next slide. Okay, so in here, uh, from the S1 to S6, we can see mostly after the pabo, uh, during the pabo, mostly the, the erosion are occur uh, along the, the coastline compared to S6 at the Tapang because these are protected by the beach um, nourishments. And also after after the post pabo, and then uh, a little bit uh, a recovery we can 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 uh, can found in this area, especially on S1 uh, and S2. But S3 and S4, uh, these uh, these uh, anthropogenic beaches or they have uh, many kind of anthropogenic activities. So the erosion still moving, still moving uh, until it will really stop when the authorities put some of the structure or put the some cost protections. So uh, that we need to understand. Uh, the coastal erosions have uh, again have many uh, have many factors uh, on erosion uh, by the erosion being influenced. Okay, so next. Next slide, please. Okay, next. Okay. So after we 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 can see or we can found any erosion in this area. So we need to understand what kind of the dynamics. So actually on the dynamic on erosion are mostly by the wave. So the wave dynamic of the beaches, we can see from here uh, on uh, June until to uh, October, the erosions, eh, sorry, the, the wave uh, uh, more increase. And then during December 2018, so uh, the, during the monsoon storm, the protected by the islands, uh, we can see the northwards uh, the the uh, what the wave are more decrease compared or more slow compared to the uh, southwards. But during public storms uh, along the the coastline, and we can see the the storm uh, by the public storm yeah, uh, are attacked, attacked uh, or attacking sorry attack attack uh, along the coastline, and then after the public uh, is uh, become to more like December 2018, it's more uh, slowly uh, they're protected by the islands. Okay, so next. So from here, we can see uh, on 2013 until 2020, so mostly the pattern of the, the with the wind speeds, we can see uh, the red color, uh, we show uh, the, <coughs> the monsoon, the monsoon, the wind monsoons. Okay, so, but, when the, the, the wind are more slowly that pre by previous year, so we can see on January uh, 2019, <coughs> they have a one peak, only one peak, and then they are taking by the by the wave. Uh, sorry, they will be taking the, the by the coastline <coughs> with the strong uh, wave, and then also the uh, strong wind. Okay, so next. <coughs> 
So as a conclusion, uh, every part of the cosmetication we need to understand by the many kind of factor or many kind of influence by the uh, erosions. Okay, so the proper mitigation plans by authority and researcher need to understand why is it uh, focusing by the only uh, the wave dynamics or uh, explaining activities, but we need to understand when the climate change uh, we we uh, increase or we occur uh, at the South China Sea. So we need to understand uh, the, the existing environment is not enough until uh, 2020 or until 2030. So we need to understand and then to, to, to need to, to, the objective is to secure the safety of post community and future generation. Okay, so that's all from me. So thank you uh, to moderator because inviting me to uh, this, this uh, webinar. And also uh, wish you the good luck to uh, the net presenter. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Effi, for the interesting presentation. Um, last but certainly not the very least, I would like to invite Dr. Ruhizal to present your work. Um, without delaying any more time, the floor is yours. Um, to the participants, apologies for the delay. We have some technical difficulties. Um, Dr. Rizal will be presenting as soon as he is ready with the presentation. Um, Dr. Riza, we are unable to hear your voice. I think Dr. Rohiza, most probably it's because of the setting of your microphone, I guess. So maybe you accidentally changed uh, the setting. Probably you can have a look at that.
I guess maybe while waiting for Dr. Rizal, if any of the participants do have any questions uh, that you would like to ask to any of the speakers, um, you can write it down in the chat uh, section um, located in on the left or on the bottom side of your screen. Um, just press the chat button and there's the chat box that will be pop up and you can uh, write down your questions and I will ask the questions um, when we have entered the second round. <clears throat> Hello? Uh, yes, uh, I can hear you now. Hello? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Other reason? Yes, yes, I oh, can hear you. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> but you haven't shared your alhamdulillah. slide yet. Uh, we rely too much on the technical. <laughs> <laughs> but it's good to hear your voice, uh, daughter. So you can, you can, you can uh, whenever you're ready, you can begin your presentation. Okay, I'm sharing the slides right now. Okay, great. I can see the slides. Can, can you see the, the slides? Yeah, I can see the slides. Can you see the yeah. slides? Okay. Okay. I'm afraid suddenly my video already off. Anyway, thank you to the moderator. Thank you to the Yayasan Penyelidikan Antartika Sultan Mizan and to other panelists uh, that uh, extensively covered uh, the technical parts. My parts is going to be uh, management and urban planning. So can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Hello? Doctor. Yes, yes, I can hear you, doctor. Hello? Can, can you hear me, doctor? Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, okay, great. Okay. Okay, uh, most of the slides will cover on management and urban planning. Uh, and I already shared with the organizer, and I'm sure the audience also received the, the slides. My, my intention is to share the information as many as possible. Uh, a lot of slides, but I will touch a few only to emphasize uh, on management and urban planning. I don't know why the slides uh, uh, it frozen. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Too. Uh, what about if, let's like, say, you left click the mouse button? Yeah. So in general, I'm going to cover uh, the challenges. I think has been touched by two other uh, distinguished panelists. And most of the parts I'm trying to cover uh, is on the awareness and capacity building, on the governance, you know, on the communities, especially on localizing the role of these communities. That means us. You know, even though uh, because the audience today, I believe most of us are the uh, receiver sites, not the services side. So, so I believe localizing uh, the role of what we can do and offer. Uh, so most of the slides, all of these slides, 
I'm sure has been covered by other panelists. Uh, for those who are interested, can have a look at, I believe, uh, information to stick to the storyline uh, to make sure that we know how to link between the challenges that we are having to the impact in order to uh, reduce the risk of disasters. And I'm sure we heard a lot about weather uh, and uh, this La Nina, El Nina impacted and affected on the weather. Uh, that's the main concern lately from the international communities, not only Malaysia, and uh, the effects happening very fast, uh, happening very fast. If you have a look at the trend, it happens very fast. Uh, 20, 30 years ago, the, the spikes is just stagnant, but lately we can see the increment is uh, jumping like, like crazy, like, uh, you know, like rocket. So uh, we can see the proof from our neighboring countries. They admitted that the uh, temperature of their country uh, is uh, increasing. The sea water level is increasing. The uh, heat wave occurs uh, uh, frequently. And then Malaysia also uh, happening, experiencing the same things. Uh, it affects our uh, food supplies, our palm oils, our disturbs also the consistency of our weather. So uh, this is all climate issues that we need to uh, adhere to make sure that we can see our future proof coming in for next generations. Uh, this is all the proof saying that it is happening, it is real. Uh, the, the, the key things that contributed a lot into this uh, due to the rapid development, industrialization and increasing of population. Too many people is going to inhabit on the surface of this earth, especially in urban areas, and we will consume a lot of products, foods, etc. And the uh, processes to come up with all of these uh, products will consume a lot of energy and also will release a lot of uh, energy as well. And this we need to monitor and control. So uh, this is all the proof that we are experiencing the tremendous uh, changes in our climate. Eh? So, so we need to, to be ready in terms of uh, disaster risk reduction plan, our urban planning, our governance, our infrastructure and mechanism. Eh? This is all showing that uh, we are facing with the threat. Uh, uh, and uh, it proves from the studies that we are experiencing uh, extreme weather, heat wave, flooding, is COVID, uh, uh, cause of uh, living, to, to uh, uh, cure all of uh, and to treat all of this uh, and, and uh, the sea water level is increasing from time to time and it's happening we need to see what we can, can do to mitigate all of these effects if, some of the area will be uh, sinking for sure and then due to the floods due to the uh, uncertainty of uh, pollution contamination of the sea 
sea water temperature etc will make things worse definitely and then uh, due to the increasing number of population uh, we need more land uh, for housing for development etc and then in Penang we will do a lot of uh, reclamation projects and and, and uh, it will uh, give some effects as well whether positive or negative to the ecological system uh, and then in, in 20 to 30 years time we can see around uh, 10 to 100 mm increment uh, so so we need to be prepared on how we can mitigate the effects of the increasing uh, level of the sea and this is uh, how we measure on whether our communities are ready or not do they capable on uh, facing with all of these effects uh, as a community or as an institution we need to come up with uh, our mitigation plan in terms of physical social and economic uh, otherwise, uh, if we don't increase the capacity building uh, within our community, and then uh, we will make things worse. That's why some part of other developed countries, they are aware of this. In fact, uh, many years ago, uh, like, like in, in Holland, in, in Japan, in, in Taiwan, they already do the mitigation plan. They already invested in how they can uh get ready uh, in terms of uh, infrastructure and in terms of knowledge and skill as well uh, that's why uh, technology will help this is where the scientists come in to make sure that we can uh, measure what really needed to make sure that our people are resilient to the threat of this type of disasters And then, and we have, if we have a look at Malaysia, most of the threats comes from uh, the water causes, whether from uh, heavy rain or sea water level uh, increment or high tide, etc. That cause to the flooding. Flooding is the secondary disaster. So we need to see how we can reduce the impacts, uh, how we can get ready for the primary disaster uh, to receive the storms or uh, heavy rains, etc., to make sure that we can reduce the impacts of floods. Uh, so water management is going to be the uh, major task uh, for irrigation department, for example, that working uh, alongside together with uh, the works department and our disaster management agencies and other uh, local authorities so water is going to be uh, the way forward that we can we should look into in order to mitigate the the effects of uh, uh, climate change uh, and this is what we went through earlier we already agreed to paris agreement etc and and the next slides uh, the, the the government themselves admitted that we are facing the threats, the data, what they have shows that it is happening. Uh, it is not no more uh, gossips or uh, to scare the people about the real is climate change is happening. And this is all the data that uh, the audience can uh, refer it back later on. And, and it is all very helpful in order for you to uh, uh, follow on the storyline of this presentation. I'm sure there's a lot of data. Uh, and this is the interesting part. Uh, if we really want to change, we have to start from the community, the bottoms up. And I'm sure the the governance uh, they are already moving forward on uh, overcoming on the impacts, but we as a community have to uh, works from diversity into a unity, you know, as a one. 
because currently what we are doing is we uh, the blame game you know we we put the the blame on others how about us what we can do now it is on us so currently this is what we we are doing uh, to have a look at energy the biggest part the contributor on the uh, climate effects uh, the waste uh, also the agriculture industrial but the biggest chunk 60 to 70 percent comes from the energy we generate electricity from the fossils and this is what we need to see if you want to uh, maintain uh, we want to conserve we don't want to see any more the uh, increasing temperature uh, because temperature is the key, the trigger, you know, the, the, the temperature and the uh, condensation means the content in the air, the water drops in the air, the content. If we went, if you want to make sure that the climate is not changing very fast, if we can control temperature and uh, precipitations, uh, we can prolong the effects uh mitigates or uh, at least we can make sure the 1.2 uh, that already been increased from the industrial period until now can be uh, uh, packed into only that temperature if we increase another 1.5 a lot of uh, creatures habitants will be affected definitely so Temperature and precipitations are the key on how we can uh, handle to monitor uh, the, the climate uh, effects. So this is the top down. The governments uh, already look at this already. I'm sure that they know uh what are the parameters that they need uh, to have a look into in order to make sure that uh our mechanism mechanism the system the infrastructure is up to the standards that we can uh work together to make sure it can deliver uh what we are afraid of is this is just a talk we don't want to uh to let the only the top guns talking about this we want to make sure that all of this information uh, receive or reach to the grassroots eh, like us to the villagers to the fishermen etc what we can do together because agriculture also contribute into uh, co2 emissions okay and this is the uh, standards of disaster management and this is the Southeast Asia, what, what the international community, especially in Southeast Asia, is doing. And this is uh, Malaysia. And uh, we have uh, NADMA, uh, National Agencies for Disaster Management. They set up uh, DDC, DDCC and Disaster Management Coordination Center. And this is the infrastructure that they are having, the system. Uh, what what uh, uh, will differentiate between those who are doing the mitigation or not, they have to set up a system, whether locally, nationally, and regionally. And the system need to uh, link with uh, a cross-border country uh, to, to make sure the coordination and the share of information. Lately, information is very uh, uh, important to make sure that uh, the information can be reached to the grassroots. That's why the gadgets, no ICT, the apps, very important to make sure that we have early warnings, for example, to make sure that uh, not only the officers aware of what is happening, but also on the ground in order to uh, spread the news, etc. And this is a center and other infrastructure that uh, they are having and met uh, Malaysia work uh, uh, very efficiently. 
And this is all the infrastructure that the Malaysia have, particularly on managing the water, managing the water. And due to the water management, landslide also part of it, the secondary disaster that we need to look after. And this is how the community should uh, participate. Uh, we cannot let only authorities to uh, take care of climate change. The, co the community as well can do their part, including the students uh, at school, etc. And other country is doing it. Uh, we need to uh, see what we can do right, to make sure that we can uh, in line with the direction of uh, other international communities. Uh, in conclusion, what I can say, we cannot work alone. We will have to work hand in hand with other international communities. Uh, lately, a digital community. Lately, we, are, we need to uh, spread the news on what is happening around us, what we can do. We need to support uh, what is green, what is not, what is hazardous to the environment what will contribute the most to the uh, increasing temperature of the earth, uh, urban heat island, what we can do to make sure that we can reduce the temperature uh, because uh, in the future people, 70% will live in the urban area. In fact, in Malaysia, we already experiencing this, 70% of the Malaysian population living in urban area. So uh, we can discuss more uh, in the Q&A. And then I hope you will revisit the slide presentation because I live with, uh, to me, uh, a good data eh, to, to, for awareness and capacity building of Malaysians. So, uh, I, I leave it to, I pass it back to the Dr. Moderator on uh, the, the next phase of, of this session. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much Dr. Riza for the great presentation. And on that note, we have come to the end of the first round. Um, and I reckon that we have a lot of questions from the participant, but due to the limited time remaining, we will try to entertain as many questions as possible. Um, well, we'll try to finish it before 4.45, so hopefully we can entertain uh, most of the questions that, that has been uh, given by the participant in the chat box. Uh, but before I open the session to the audience, here's a gentle reminder to introduce yourself and where yeah, are you from and please make your question as brief as possible because we wanted to allow as many questions to be asked as possible uh, before we round out so um, we already have one question uh, from Miss Ain Zakaria uh, she's from the School of Aerospace Engineering USM and her question is directed to um, Dr. Shiba so Dr. Shiba based on your research on El Nino and La Nina um, do you agree on the hypothesis saying that the unstable global temperature can increase the activity of seismic uh, activities? So please, Dr. Ziba. <clears throat> um, thank you, uh, Nur Ainin, Ain, for your question. Um, actually, I'm not a, a person to talk about seismic activities because I'm an atmospheric scientist, but um, saying that um, I think uh, the um, rapid movement of glaciers because of the melting, uh, it can cause uh, uh, seismic activities. Um, when the temperature increase, there will be more melting uh, from the polar region. So it become um, unstable, you know, the uh, land can become unstable because of the permafrost melting. So it can cause seismic activities. That is what I know about but um, I'm not sure about, is there any direct link between the um, increase in the global temperature and seismic activities? Because as far as I know, seismic activity is because of the um, changes in the Earth's crust, right? A platelet movement, right? So there might not be direct 
um, impact. But um, as I said, because of the glacial melting, um, the glaciers um, will be flowing to the, towards the um, ocean region, and there will be a lot of instabilities. And also, there are permafrost melting over the polar region, especially Arctic. So it can cause seismic activity. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Shiba. Um, we have also, we also have another question from uh, Miss Crystal Ng. Um, she's from uh, University of Malaysia Sabah, and she also has a, a two question to Dr. Shiba as well. Um, her first question, uh, most maybe I can uh, direct you with the both of the question, and then you can answer the questions. Um, uh, the two questions. Um, straight away okay so the first question is when la nina happened in the pacific ocean uh, will it also happen in the indian ocean so if yes the warm sea surface temperature will be blown further to the west instead of just staying in malaysia causing extreme precipitation and that's the question mark over there and then the second one is what is the difference between oni and soi because uh, can we use SOI to determine ENSO in Malaysia or ONI is more precise than ENSO, um, SOI? So um, I'd like to invite Dr. Shiba again to answer this question. Okay, um, I think I will answer the first question. Um, um, actually, maybe you are thinking of the Indian Ocean Dipole. So there are, um, and so is one of the natural uh, tropical variability, right? <clears throat> so there are many other tropical variability, right? Like um, made in Julian oscillation, MJO, or IOD, that is Indian Ocean Dipole. So um, that is the, uh, there will be like a difference of uh, temperature over the western side of the Indian Ocean and eastern side of the Indian Ocean. So that is called IOD. That is a different um, um, variability. Um, it is not related to ENSO, but some Sometimes, you know, these two variabilities can interact with each other also. Um, so that is the, uh, I think that will answer your first question. Um, the second question is about ONI and SOI, right? So ONI is based on, as I mentioned during my presentation, that is based on the sea surface temperature over the NINO uh, 3.4 degree um, um, yeah, that area, Nino 3.4 area, right? So this is uh, based on the, um, the uh, what do you call, um, temperature anomaly over that region. Um, so that area is bigger. And uh, SOI, that is Southern Oscillation Index, that is based on the, um, the mean sea level pressure over two regions. That is uh, Tahiti and Darwin. Darwin is near Australia, and Tahiti is kind of middle of the uh, Pacific, right? So this uh, this SOI is just based on this two um, station pressure. So and uh, ONI is based on the area average, right? So ONI will be usually um, a better representative for ENSO than SOI. So these are two different. Um, index um, because of the temperature changes there will be also pressure kind of seesaw you know um, during uh, and uh, only know uh, there will be lower pressure over one region and higher pressure over that other region and it will switch so um, SOI uh, as I said it's based on the uh, mean sea level pressure ONI is based on the sea surface temperature and it is over a larger area so usually ONI will be more accurate than SOI Okay, great. Thank, thank you very much, Dr. Shiba, and thank you as well to Miss Crystal Ern for the question. Um, next, we also have another question in the chat box, but um, just uh, just just uh, to uh, remind uh, the participant, you can also uh, unmute your microphone because we're in the Q and A session, so you can directly ask the question. But um, um, but if you wanted to, still you still wanted to write it down in the chat box, so no problem. So next, we have another question from uh miss anna and she is uh asking she wanted to ask this question to dr shiba so um her question is so far you have presented on the teleconnections between antarctic and the indian monsoon so um she's she's wondering whether it has the same connection as to malaysia so dr shiba i guess maybe you can um answer this question okay 
Thanks, Anna, for your question. Um, actually, when we did the analysis for the Antarctic sea ice extent and uh, um, Indian summer monsoon rainfall, um, we were actually looking at different um, sea ice sector and correlating it with different uh, monsoon rainfall. Um, so that's just how we find out there is a, a you know strong correlation between the um, Indian summer monsoon rainfall and also this summer monsoon rainfall is um, related. Uh, the correlation is just on the peninsula region of India. It's not the whole, um, uh, you know, uh, the Indian rainfall. Um, so that's why we investigated more and we talk about the mechanism. So we haven't seen any relationship on Antarctic sea ice and, um, you know, monsoon over Malaysia. But um, having said that, um, when we analyze some of the plots, we see there is some relationship. So we need to, you know, um, uh, investigate more on that to get any um, um, any um, concluding result for that. Um, but definitely there is relationship between um, Arctic oscillation or Arctic and the uh, Malaysian um, Northeast monsoon. Thank you very much, Dr. Shiba. Um, so I think we still have uh, enough time for one more question. So, uh, is there any more question from the participants? If you do have any question, uh, you can unmute your microphone, you can introduce where you are from, and you can uh, basically ask the question to any of the speakers uh, that you wanted to ask. Okay, so um, I guess there is no more question. So thank you very much to all the participants and to the, um, the speakers as well. So we have come towards the end of our forums. And before we conclude it, I just wanted to say that it is a privilege for me to steer today's forum session, which in my opinion and interest discussion has been delivered by our esteemed speakers from different backgrounds. So we hope that this turned out to be a fruitful discussion and participants learned something from our session this evening. And once again, I would like to say thank you to our panelists for their scholarly and comprehensive sharing, as well as to all the participants for your cooperation and attendance for today's event. Um, I apologize if there are any disruption or intrusion which may have caused inconveniences throughout these sessions, but please stay tuned and like Wipeism Facebook page to get updates from time to time for more webinar series in the futures. Um, happy Ramadan and happy fasting to everyone, and we'll see each other again soon. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, and goodbye. <clears throat>